everyone. We're so glad you can join us and worship with us today. Um, yeah, before we w started practice, we were talking about how much we miss worshiping with you all physically um, in this space together. Um, and it just reminded me of before COVID happened, um, I did this thing every Sunday before I pulled up to church. I would sort of imagine the doors of the church as like the gates of heaven. And I would just try to imagine what it might look like in the spiritual realm. And it would help me imagine, um, it would remind me that I was going to enter God's home mm -hmm. and that he was gonna be in this place. And it kind of brought me in that, prepared my heart for that. Um, and so, and whatever, burdens I had, whatever distractions I had, I would literally like kind of sit in my car and lay it all, all out there before I came in. And um, I know we don't have that physical face. We don't have those physical doors to walk through. And you might just be sitting in your homes. Um, but wherever you are, I just, I just ask that we take a moment to come before his presence. And because his presence is here, this is church and we are in god's home right now so um yeah and we can come to him just as we are and he will love us just as we are as dearly loved children so let's just take a moment to come into his presence before we worship
our next song is going to be, Oh, Come to the Altar. Father, we just thank you for 
this invitation that you've given us. God, that you are the ruler of all that we see. You are not bound by time or place. And yet, you invite us by name. You know us. And so we thank you so much, God, for that invitation. And we pray that this morning, that we would all take that invitation seriously. Even for those of us that are already followers of Christ. God, may we listen and obey as if it's for the first time. And those of us who maybe don't know you personally, God, or those of us who have just been on the edge, the periphery, not really, not really engaged at church, just checking it out for the first time, God, may that invitation be just as welcoming and, and heartfelt. May we understand that through the words of these songs, through the words of the passage, it's an invitation to receive the great love that you have for us. So we just thank you for reminding us of that today. And God, as we continue to worship, God, may our response, may the way that we answer for that invitation be true and be something that leads to this life-giving relationship and a deeper understanding of who you are. So thank you, Lord God, for this time of worship. We praise you and we love you and pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you for leading us in worship. Uh, welcome. Today is the first day of November. Uh, we are almost uh, finishing up our, our 2020. It's been quite an eventful one. A um, couple of announcements before we, we read the passage for today. Uh, November 13th, Friday, 7 o'clock, there is a, a special workshop and seminar um, and uh, we have a, a phenomenal guest speaker, Dr. Josephine Kim, who teaches at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. She's going to be joining us and leading a workshop. And on the link that you'll, you'll see um, on our website as well as our social media, it says parents and teachers, but uh, anybody who is a Korean American, Asian American, anybody who uh, is interested in learning about um, mental wellness and, and me mental well-being, health, uh, would benefit from that time. And so uh, it's not often that we have Dr. Kim available to speak. Uh, she came, I think, once in 2010. Uh, but, you know, due to the pandemic, we have her available. And so November 13th, Friday, 7 p.m., uh, there is a link on our website to sign up. Uh, space is limited, and so we, we, you know, would want you to be able to, to join with us that evening. Um, so please sign up, and, and we look forward to having a, a really good time of learning and just... Um, just growth from that. So Friday, November 13th, uh, 7 p.m. Um, with that, uh, we'll have Jeremiah reading our passage for us today. Hello. The passage today comes from 1 John 3, verses 1 through 3, and it says, See what great love the Father has given us, that we should be called God's children, and we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet been revealed. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. So congratulations to all my Dodger fans the other night. Um, they won their first World Series title in 32 years. Uh, Los Angeles is quite... Uh, is on the, quite the run, uh, winning the NBA championship with the Lakers and now this. Uh, I won't mention that there is an asterisk next to both titles because of the pandemic. I'm just kidding. Um, Dave Roberts is the manager of the Dodgers. And uh, excitingly, he's the first Asian American manager to ever win the World Series. Dave is half Japanese uh, and was born in Okinawa. Uh, but I remember him for a very different reason. Uh, in sports and in the playoffs, uh, in a best of seven series, a three to nothing lead for uh, one team is pretty much insurmountable. If you build a, two, a three to nothing lead, it pretty much means you're going to win the series. And in 2004, the Red Sox and the Yankees were in the ALCS, and the Yankees had a three nothing series lead with a four to three game four lead going into the ninth inning. So the Yankees are up four to three. Uh, non, for my non-baseball fans, that means they just need to make three outs 
and the game is over and the series is over. But after a leadoff walk, the Red Sox sent out Dave Roberts, the current manager of the Dodgers, to pinch run. So long story short, Dave Roberts is on first, he steals a base, he scores the tying run, and the Red Sox end up winning that game, and they end up winning the next three games, and so they take the series. Um, so they would go on to beat the Yankees in seven games, they went on to beat the Cardinals in the World Series, and they ended their curse, the 86-year-old curse of the Bambino. Uh, they won their first title. That's a Dave Roberts memory that I will always keep with me. Um, and if I had a time machine, maybe that's, the one, that's one spot I might travel back to in order to change the course of events. And I wonder how many of us, uh, if we had access to a time machine, where would we go? What points in time? Are there regrets that we'd like to do over in our past? Or maybe on the flip side, is there some outcome that we're curious to find out down the road in the future? Traveling to the past, making sense of the present, predicting the future, these are all things that have been on our minds recently, haven't they? And whether it's been in the movies that we've been watching or thinking about the state of affairs in our country. And believe it or not, John, as he writes his letters to a group of churches and believers, dwelling on the past and trying to make sense of it for the present was something that John addresses here in chapter 2 of 1 John. And this is what he says in verse 18. Children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by this we know that it is the last hour. They went out from among us, from us but they did not belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. However, they went out so that it might be made clear that none of them belongs to us. Pretty heavy words. And so the community that John is addressing in 1 John is this community that is dealing with a split, a divorce, if you will. And for any family, relationship, church community, a split is something markedly painful and difficult. And here is John addressing that. And it seems that the disagreement of the people who left and the disagreement of the people who stayed, their disagreement was about what they believed about Jesus. Who is Jesus really? And those that left, they denied that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God. And in some ways, that differing of opinion continues to this day. And to me, I'm of the opinion that your answer to the question of who Jesus is, that answer colors how you live your life. To me, that's a foundational question. As an example, if Jesus is Lord and Savior, then his words and his life, they're not only going to be an inspiration for us, and they're not only going to be something that we aspire to, but his words are going to be the commands that we're called to follow, even the difficult commands, like taking up our cross daily, dying to self, and following him. That's going to be something that we don't just take as a suggestion, but we actually follow through. He is our Lord. But also, the life that he lived, the death that he died, the resurrection that he won for us, that is a ransom. That is our gift. And if we believe that Jesus is the Son of God, God incarnate, God in human form, then that's going to change everything that, about the way that we live, the way that we see the world. On the other hand, if Jesus is just a good rabbi, not the creator of the world, not the one who is timeless, his words then are probably going to be like any other guru or teacher. Their words or his words are going to be ones that can inspire and challenge and guide. But that's, that's the limit. That's probably it. And what he did with his earthly life about 2,000 years ago is nice. But if that's all that we see Jesus as, it really doesn't have any bearing for us today. And I just want to be really clear in how I put it. My hope and my prayer for all of us is that our journey and our seeking of Jesus is not just a intellectual or moral endeavor, but that we would approach him recognizing that God calls us his children. 
recognizing that this is the creator of all that we see around us, not bound by time or space. And to just think about that for a moment, how special and privileged that calling is. From verse 1 in today's passage, see what great love the Father has given to us, given us, that we should be called God's children. And we are. Most religions offer a way to connect with a higher power. And often use the metaphor of a queen or a king as that higher power relates to their subjects. Even more so, the idea of paying tribute or sacrificing to a god, that idea is pretty common. And undoubtedly, the Bible also. There are the, in the Bible, there are those same comparisons. However, if I had to pick one overarching metaphor, the father and mother and child relationship, the love relationship there is there, is the one that I would most use to describe what being in a relationship with God is like. Knowing the eternal God in a way that's like a love between a parent and a child. That's such a unique way of describing a relationship that many of us think in different terms. When it comes to relating to a deity or a God, I think most of us think of distance, a kind of awkwardness. Like you wouldn't approach some kind of higher power or even even an earthly leader, you wouldn't go to them with that kind of familiarity or that kind of closeness. But that's exactly the relationship and the metaphor that is used here in 1 John. The way parents know their kids and vice versa, the way families know each other, is such an intimate and personal connection, isn't it? And that is precisely the way that the Almighty God knows us and wants to be known by us. And in thinking about that metaphor, thinking about that relationship, the parent-child relationship is the only one that I know of where there are no conditions placed on one party in that relationship. Parents don't expect their child to be a certain way when they come out of the womb. They might, but when that child comes out of the womb, Whether you like it or not, you have to love it. From the first moment, there is love and sacrifice. Whether you're ready or not, you have to love. And there is that love. Nothing that that child can do, no matter how old or ugly or misbehaving that child may be, parents will always love their children. And so to think about that, again, the one overarching metaphor, not only in 1 John, but also all throughout the Bible. Even though the Bible uses a lot of metaphors to talk about the relationship between God and his people, I think the one overarching one is the one between parents and children. How powerful that is. Not as a stranger, not as a king or a queen and a subject, as a father and a mother and their children. That intimacy, wanting to know and be known. That's what God is is sharing with us through 1 John. Of the many things that I miss about my mom, I think her calling me out on my garbage, my BS, was always so funny to me. She knew me better than I knew myself. There would be many times that I would try to get away with something, and she just knew. My mother knew me so well that even to this day, she has me spooked. I look back. And think about times when she let me do something but didn't intervene or try to stop me. And those moments today are even more head-scratching because I swear she knew, but it's like this Jedi mind trick. Like, I'm letting you get away with this. Be afraid. Be very afraid. Like, that's the kind of intimacy and that knowledge that my mom had of me. And again, of all the metaphors that there is, I think the parent-child love relationship connection is what God is communicating to us today. Verse 1, chapter 3. See what great love the Father has given us, that we should be called God's children. And we are. And the way that John talks about this love, it's not something distant or theoretical. Just go to verse 1 of chapter 1. This is what he says. John says, what was from the beginning, what we have heard, 
what we have seen with our eyes, what we have observed and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was revealed and we have seen it and we testify and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. Verse 3, what we have seen, again, and heard we also declared to you so that you may also have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these, we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. Do you notice anything in these three verses of chapter 1? It's not ideas and knowledge and information and facts. How many times does John use the words seen, heard, felt, touched, experienced. That's what love is. The love that God has for us is not just a religious experience in terms of going somewhere. It's not just a spiritual experience that we're supposed to get on a Sunday or in a worship hall or in a sanctuary. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen, what we have observed and touched with our hands. And to me, communicates that all the things that we know of in relationships with our parents, our spouses, our friends, love is the metaphor that God is wanting to remind us of. And it's not a theoretical kind of love. It's not an idea kind of love. It's an experiential kind of love. And in 1 John, here we have saints who are testifying, sharing their stories of what knowing God looks like. It's in the stories of their lives. It's as they share meals. It's as they listen to one another and go over to each other's houses for coffee and tea and raising children together and going through difficult times together. That's what experiencing knowing God looks like. And faith for John is, quote, the testimony of the real life, the embodied experience that has been given to them by God. And as I said, the glue that holds all of this together in this letter and the churches that are addressed here, what would we call that? We would call that love, community. And I would say that that first part of connection with God is that we must be known. We must be known. And in a spiritual sense, God being the creator, of course he knows who we are. Even if we don't do anything, he's eternal, he is ethereal, he is You know, the Almighty, he knows us. He knows everything about us. But the thing about John's epistle, as well as the rest of the Bible, is you will not find a story about one individual who is isolated and cut off from community. Part of God knowing his creation is that he uses the bodies, the church, the gatherings of people in order to show what his love looks like. We cannot truly be known by God if we are all alone. We must be in community. And I don't know who needs to hear that this morning. And I don't know if, for those of you out there who are listening, that church has always been just a, again, check off the box, come to church. I don't really need to get too close. I don't really need to get too involved. I don't need to be too committed. In order to really be known by God, we have to be in community. In order to be really loved by God, We have to be in community. That's the first thing that I see in this passage today. The other part that is really powerful is once again the reminder of time. The present, the past, and the future. And I think in our congregation, many will agree that if we spend too much time focused on the past and the future, that's not healthy. There must be a proper balance in how we live reflectively, learning from the past. Well, almost. (laughs) Uh, There must be proper balance in how we live reflectively, learning from the past while not dwelling there. I think the same goes for the future. We have to live with a kind of realistic view of the future. We have to have a vision for the future. But we're called to live in the present. And all of them are important, past, present, and future. Not just the amount of time that we spend in these three places, but also to think about how we engage with them. Are we stuck in the past? Do we deny the influence that it has on our present? 
for the future? Are we living with vision? Are we looking ahead? Or are we just living for today? I think the Bible teaches us to remember, to live in the present, but also to live with vision. All three elements are needed. But I think for me, the present is the key that holds all of it together. I think that's why verse 2 is such a timely reminder. Whether we're stuck in one or the other, John reminds us that we are all God's children now. Verse 2, dear friends, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet been revealed. On a side note, I don't know what that means, but that's so exciting. What we will be hasn't been revealed. We are God's children now. And and verse 3 says, powerfully. We don't know what we're going to be yet. It hasn't been revealed. But we know that when Jesus appears, we will be like him because we will see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies themselves just as Jesus is pure. And so it's an amazing thing that we live in the present, we are God's children now, and in the future we'll be still God's children in a, in a glorified form, in a supernatural form, in a, in a, I don't know, in a glorified form, amazing. But in that identity as God's children, Jesus is our brother, our, our, the first fruit. Jesus is the one who purifies us and makes us right before God. It's kind of an exciting thing. But don't miss what John is saying. Verse 2, once again. Dear friends, and I say this to all of us listening. Dear friends, we are God's children now. We are God's children now. There is nothing further that we need to do or earn. We are already children of God. And in in a culture and in a time where it's very based on what we do, our achievements, our, our efforts, our work, John reminds us that we are children now. So today, right here, in this moment, you are a child of God. Whether you realize it or not, whether you like it or not, you are a child of God. And so think, reflect. How are you right now in your life showing God's love in your identity as children, your actions individually or as a family or as a community, whatever it is? This church, how are we as Bethel showing God's love in our identity? Do we realize that we are God's children? Are we striving because we're trying to earn something from God? Or is it we already realize how blessed we are to be called children of God and we're just living in that identity, sharing that message with whoever we will meet? And my encouragement is as we live in that present reality today as children of God, that will give us healing and strength as we think about our past but also will give us vision for the future, knowing and holding on to Christ, realizing that he is our Savior, our God, our Lord. In past, present, and future, there is not a point that we were not or will never be children of God. There is not a point. We are always, we always have been, we always will be children of God. Psalm 46.1, as I close, God is our refuge and strength, a helper who is always found in times of trouble. Jesus is our, God is our our Father, who is always found with us, present. Let's pray. Father, we're so used to striving and working really hard. And Lord, that's not a bad thing, but Lord, if we're honest with ourselves, all of that working and striving, it, it causes within us just a, uh, a system or a belief that we have to be good enough in order to receive love 
or we have to meet a certain standard in order to be accepted. But what we see in, in 1 John, what we see in the Bible is something that is so opposite to that. A love that is given to us. A love that is won for us on the cross. And through Jesus, God, you give us this amazing gift. And you don't call us strangers or even friends, but you call us your children. And how intimate and personal that is. And how wonderful a calling. And I pray that for whoever is out there that needs to hear that this morning, you are a child of God. God, may that be the song in our hearts. May that be the, the reminder that we walk away from this morning service with. We are children of God. Forgiven. Blessed. And whatever challenges may present themselves from our past, our present, and future. God, may that identity as your children give us the strength that we need and the courage that we need to live with hope. In Jesus' name we pray.
I'm going to invite you to stand for the benediction. But before I give you the benediction, hearing the words of that song just reminded me, uh, maybe that's homework for us um, this week, just to look at the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And just look at Jesus and what he's doing. That even if we bow before him, even if the people that meet him are, are humbled or they're sick, how he lowers himself, how he embraces them. It's never this, I'm a king, I'm the creator God, worship me or die. It's such this intimacy and it's this love that I believe he's extending to all of us today. If we would just receive that love and respond. And now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is not afraid to humble himself, not afraid to embrace and welcome and, and pour out his love on all of us, no matter where we are at, to not only call us his friends, but also his children. And the love of our God the Father, such a strong and powerful, never-ending Love, like a parent loves their child. And the blessing of the Holy Spirit, may these be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody.